Let's start with Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and then we'll start with the introduction. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever, my, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that you grant us to listen to your word and to listen uh, and hear and be taught by Psalm 51. Holy Spirit, as you were with us in the first service, I ask that you continue to be with us now. Grant me the gift of teaching and preaching. Grant us the gift of hearing and listening, that we may obey you to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, exalt the Son. Amen. You know, I have found that uh, one of the many aspects of pastoral ministry has been to listen to the confessions of people's sins. Not that they're confessing them to me, but I've been able to bear witness as many have confessed their sins before the Lord, and um, I've been there. Don't worry, I'm not going to share any of those confessions. But the pastoral ministry has allowed me to witness uh, many sins confessed to Christ. I have seen many uh, men, women, some on even their deathbed, begging God for mercy found on the cross. I have found that that place, that time of confession, has been one of the most intimate of moments that a Christian can, can bear witness to. Not simply because a uh, man is or a woman or someone is confessing things that they have done that are wrong before God, but even more than this, because one becomes very aware that the God they have offended is present, listening, making an audience as this man confesses their sin. I must confess it has been one of the most intimate of places that I have been as a Christian because I have been made more aware of the presence of God when a sinner calls upon the name of Christ for forgiveness. In a very similar way, you and I get to go into that secret place today. You and I, as we examine Psalm 51, get to go into that intimate place where a man has sinned against his God and is presenting the secrets of his heart, the nakedness of his soul before him, asking for forgiveness. That's what Psalm 51 is about. And in fact, that's going to be our first, our very first point here. First observation is that this is a sinner's hymn. This is a hymn, a song composed of a deep, deep person who has been in sin. David has sinned. Look at verse 1 with me. My transgressions. Verse 2, my iniquity, my sin. And verse 4 it gets very clear and kind of summarizes these first four verses. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Uh, Psalm 51 is, is a song of a sinner coming before his God, confessing his sins. And in the introduction to the psalm, if you got to see the introduction of the psalm in Hebrew, th th this is verse 0. Okay? And in the very introduction, we find the specific sins that he is addressing here, which is uh, unique in, in, the, in the psalmist. Uh, we find uh, the things he has specifically done wrong, which he is addressing. So let's look at that introduction to get that, okay? Verse 0 says, To the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now that introduction is an introduction that might bring uh, quite, you know, none of us would like to have our sins displayed for the whole people of God to, to see. That's exactly what's going on here. Um, all of Israel, as they read this introduction, knew exactly what sins uh, they're talking about. And you might remember this as well. We find these sins uh, in the introduction in, first, in 2 Samuel, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And you're going to remember that when kings go out to war, says 2 Samuel 11, that David stayed home. He stayed home, and as he was walking uh, at the rooftop, um, he saw Bathsheba taking a bath and his 
sinful appetite started to, to arise. And he was led by his sinful desires. And he called Bathsheba to himself. And they told him, this is Uriah's wife. This is not your wife, David. But David took her anyway. Slept with her. And where was Uriah? You might remember that he was in the battlefield. And the battle that David was supposed to be in, but chose not to go to. He was fighting, uh, defending the name of the Lord for the glory of God with the Ark of the Covenant in the battlefield while David was sleeping with his wife. First Sam, Second Samuel 11 also tells us and informs us and gives us the, the, uh, the information that we find in the introduction of Psalm 51 to see that Bathsheba was pregnant. Bathsheba, Bathsheba was pregnant and Uriah wasn't home. So David has a plan, and he, he has a plan of calling Uriah back to Israel, hoping that Uriah will go sleep in his house, have intimacy with his wife, and perhaps David can cover up his sin by passing off the child in Bathsheba's womb to Uriah. But much to David's surprise, Uriah is a man of integrity, and when he wakes up and after sending him home, he, he sees that he did not go home. And Uriah is sleeping at the steps of the palace. Um, David is kind of upset and disappointed at his plan. He's not working. He says, well, Uriah, I thought I told you to go home. I thought I told you to go home. And Uriah, Uriah's response, I'll read it to you, 2 Samuel eleven eleven. Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths or in tents. And my lord Joab, the general, and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. What a man. It's a man's man. Man of integrity. What should have occurred here was a deep conviction should have fallen upon David. That he had not only done wrong, but here's a man who trusts God, lives a life in integrity to show him that he's in the wrong. But he did not. He continued to let this sin grow and grow. So he develops a plan, and perhaps you might remember the plan. The plan that David comes up with is to write a letter, sending Uriah into the very fierce areas of the battlefield that he may die there. He writes this letter and seals it and puts it in the very hands of Uriah, sending him to the general Joab. So Uriah literally is holding his faith in his hands. And David, knowing that this man was a man of integrity, would not dare open that letter, goes to the general. General Joab opens the letter. And this is what the letter says. 2 Samuel eleven fifteen. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. This is the sweet psalmist of Israel. And he's guilty of adultery, of bearing false witness, and the very hands that he used to play the harp to sing praises to his God have now the innocent blood of Uriah. This song is about a man who has sinned against God. And this might get you a little bit. It's about a man who believes and has trusted in God. This is a believer that we find in Psalm 51. Who has allowed his sinful appetites to take control of his life. And now he has dishonored the people he was supposed to care for, dishonored the men he was in charge of, and dishonored the God that has redeemed him. What does this man deserve? Perhaps yes, death. That takes us to the second point. This, this is a song of a broken sinner, because in the introduction we also hear that this is when Nathan the prophet, perhaps about a year after this, confronts David, presents him with the parable of a man who had everything and took what the poor man had. 
And David gets furious when he hears such a story and says, this man must pay. How dare he take from, from the poor man? He has enough. To which Nathan replies, oh, David, you are the man. God, by the Holy Spirit and the prophet, confront David's sin. You have despised God's law, Nathan says. You have despised your God. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. What we find in Psalm 51 is the song of a man who has sinned against his God and is full of shame, is full of embarrassment, feels condemned, and feels completely isolated from the God he loves. And sin has done this. This is a song of a sinner. This is a song of a sinner. And it would do us right to listen to what this psalmist says because in verse uh, 14 or so, follow, follow with me, excuse me, verse 13. In verse 13 of Psalm 51, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. In other words, Psalm 51 is set forth by the psalmist that we may find, when we find ourselves in a place as dark as he was, might follow the very steps to mercy and to the merciful God that he did. He wants to teach sinners the ways of God, how to approach the holy and merciful God in Christ. So it would do us good to follow the steps of sincerity and brokenness that the psalmist does teach us. And we begin with uh, one of our first and second observations here, a plea for the mercy of God. A plea for the mercy of God. This is how the psalm begins. Look at verse 1 and 2 with me. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Mercy. That's what he's appealing for. Look at the first verse. Have mercy on me. The parallel line. According to your steadfast love. Notice that David dares not bring his own merits before the throne. He dares not bring his prestige nor his kingly crown and say, because I am a king, because I am a shepherd, because I have done this, none of that is there. For none of it will stand. He is guilty. So he pleads for mercy. The word mercy in the Hebrew has the, the idea of, of, of speaking of the bowels, the inner part of the stomach. It is often used in the Hebrew speaking of a mother's dear love and, and pursuit and care for, his, for their child. He says, Lord, please, because of your mercy. And then he uses the phrase steadfast love. This is a Hebrew word and phrase that was often understood by the Israelites and the people of God as to when God delivered them from Egypt and made his name known to them, saying that he was slow to anger and steadfast in love. David does not appeal to anything else but to the covenant promises, nor does he appear to his own merits, but the merits that perhaps may be found in the promises of God and the character of God. Oh Lord, remember your covenant with your people. Remember that you have shown yourself to be merciful to us. And that is what he needs. For I heard someone say here, he deserves death. And that is what he deserves. That is what he deserves. I would like to read the, the, the words of Murdoch Campbell saying this very thing. David had committed two sins for which the Mosaic law provided no forgiveness. For deliberate murder and adultery, death was the inevitable, inevitable penalty. He knew that before God there was no forgiveness through any sacrifices which he might offer or any gifts he might present. David knows he has nothing to give. According to the law of God which he broke, the penalty for adultery was to be stoned to death. The penalty for bearing false witness and false witness that led to the murder of an innocent man was to be stoned. There is nothing that David deserves but in the love of God, the mercies of God, the forgiveness of God, the favor of God, the grace of God. 
and he knows it, lawbreaker before a holy God. So a plea for mercy is the appropriate response for when we have sinned. To appeal not to our merits, to come to him not with our list of things that we have done right, for none of them are good. It has often been said that mercy is the sole basis of any approach to God by sinners. How true is this? As Dr. James Montgomery Boyce pointed out on this very subject in Psalm 51, Boyce says the only reason we dare come to God and dare have hope for a solution to our sin problem is His mercy. Nothing else will do. A plea for the mercy of God is what we see in verses 1 through 2. And there are three illustrations pleading for this mercy. The first one is, is found in, in, the, in the first petition that we find when he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. And then he says, Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions is one of the illustration that he presents before God. The idea is of a recorded tablet. A recorded tablet with his debt on it. It's almost as if God divinely has recorded his sins and David is so embarrassed, he is so in debt and there's nothing he can do but plead for God to be merciful and says, blot them out. Or perhaps, you know, in the ancient world, if a man was forgiven his debt, they would take that tablet and they would break it, symbolizing that it would be remembered no more. That's similar to the idea that David is asking of God. Before him are his sins and he says, break them. Remember them no more. Erase them completely from your tablet. And then he says, the psalmist in verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash me is the second illustration that is given. And it has the idea of dirty clothes. For as dirt is to the body, so is sin to the inner man. And David feels filthy. The Hebrew ideas here are that of literally grabbing a dirty garment and scrubbing it until there is no more stains on it. And that is how David feels. And he asks of God to be merciful to him and to wash him thoroughly from his iniquity, for he has sinned. And then he says, cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. This has the idea of purification. The illustration and, and images that we should see are that of when an Israelite is on his way to worship or a priest is on his way to worship and he has defiled himself and is in need of presenting a sacrifice in the, in the temple and washing himself with water in order to be pure before he brings his sacrificial worship. This helps us understand a little bit more about David's situation. You see, his sin has separated him from his God. In a way, he feels so isolated from him and alone from him. And he feels as though he can no longer present his worship. He asks of God, cleanse me from my sin that I may be in your presence. Clean from my conscience. See, that's what sin does. That is what habitual sin does. Does it not make us feel dirty before him? Shameful before him. The white garments that he has given us by the blood of Christ. Do they not feel defiled when we deliberately disobey our God? Do not we feel distant and unable to raise hands and sing before him? David pleads for mercy. The psalmist's supplications remind me of Luke's tax collector. When Jesus speaks of the tax collector in Luke 18, there is a Pharisee who goes into the temple to pray, and then there is a tax collector who could not even look up to the heaven and was standing far off. Do you remember this tax collector? And then he beats himself, beats his chest with his head down saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what's going on in Psalm 51. The psalmist comes before the heavenly throne saying, I am that sinner. Be merciful to me. Psalm 51 is David bringing the same request from God, from the very God he has offended. David has deviated from the things of God. The psalmist has distanced himself from his Savior. 
David let his sinful desires dominate his life. And now his relationship with his Redeemer is estranged and interrupted. He feels dirty, guilty, and ashamed, and without the right to be able to approach his God. But the psalmist knows his God is compassionate and steadfast in love. This is the promise he has made with his people, the promise he has made by covenant with Abraham. The psalmist knows Yahweh has provided atonement for his people. And although David did not see it clearly, David knew that the Messiah, judge of the world, whom God had chosen, would die for the sins of his people. For the psalmist of Psalm 51 is also the psalmist of Psalm 2, where the Messiah is to judge all the enemies and sinners of the world. And the psalmist of Psalm 51 is also the writer of Psalm 22. Do you remember Psalm 22, the psalm of the cross, where we see Messiah dying for the sins of his people? Oh, David remembers the compassion that God has by covenant for his people. So he approaches with a broken and contrite spirit, not to ask for what he deserves, but to ask for what he knows he doesn't mercies of God. If there's a sinner here today in need of the forgiveness, we have here the prayer that God listens to, one that pleads for mercy. Second point that we should look at here, and this will be our third observation, is the, pro the broken sinner's confession. This is how a broken sinner, a genuine repentant sinner sounds like. And we can see it in the confession that the psalmist brings. I invite you to look at uh, the verse 3 with me. Verse 3 says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Confession. That is what we are observing in these verses. Confession is to say the same things about our sin that God says about our sin. Or as Dr. Stephen Lawson put it, the confession of sin is the uncovering of our sin before God and exposing it for what it is. And that is exactly what David is saying. He's saying, it is I who have sinned. It is I who have rebelled. Notice the first uh, phrase in, in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Transgressions. It's the Hebrew word peshaw, which means to cross a line divinely set. It's the idea of God saying, go no further. And David saying, I will. It's the idea of God saying, no, son, do not go that distance. And David saying, I will. It is deliberate rebellion and disobedience. And David says, blot out my transgressions. I have rebelled. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, says the psalmist in verse 2. My iniquity, another Hebrew word to describe the deviation. The deviation that David has taken. He knew the right way and he chose not to follow. He knew it was wrong to love, but he chose to do so. And then in verse two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is the most common word that we have here, literally meaning sin, and sin meaning I missed the mark. It has the idea of I have failed. I have failed. A paraphrase of all this would be, Lord, I am wrong. I am so wrong. And what you decide to do with me is fair and correct. Let us make some observations of what genuine confession sounds like and looks like. Notice that confession is absent of pride. It is absent of arrogance and self-justification. Notice that confession, true confession, there are no accusations and culpability of others. It was him, it was because of him, it was because of her, it was because of the way I grew up, absent from all excuses. It is the opposite 
of the self-justification and the response of Adam when God asked Adam, where are you? How told you that you were naked? And Adam said, it was the woman that you gave me. It is the opposite of excuses, the opposite of reasoning. It is absent from ifs, ands, or buts. It is, Lord, it was me. I did it. Me, me, me. I am guilty. I am the rebel. I am the sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Note that this confession is not just simple remorse for the consequences of divine punishment. David knows that he may lose his life. David knows that God has every right to take his earthly life for breaking these laws and shaming his name. But look at verse 4. In verse 4, the psalmist says, You may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. What we see here is, Lord, have mercy on me and do with me as you will, but bring me to right communion with you, even if you need to punish me. This is not just simple remorse. This is a desire to be right with his God. What we see is full acceptance of responsibility for sinful actions and a humble recognition that he is under the loving and disciplining hand of his Redeemer. What sins might you need to confess this morning? Perhaps sins of pride or arrogance or of lust. Perhaps sins of speaking ill of others. Perhaps sins of lack of integrity. Or perhaps, like David, the dark sins of sexual immorality. The dark sins of hurting others. Of making the name of the Lord blasphemed among his people. What sins might you need to bring before him and confess and say, it is I, Lord, it is I. This psalm stands out that we may approach the merciful throne. For the judge that God has chosen is Christ, the Christ who took upon flesh and died for the sins of his people. The judge that we approach for mercy is the judge who has pierced hands, pierced for our iniquities and our transgressions. And the punishment that, that brought us peace was upon him. What we see in the psalm, is, psalm 51 is an arrow that points to the cross, that points to the merciful judge and savior, Jesus Christ who although we have stepped away, calls us and confronts us today, much like Nathan the prophet confronted David, saying, I have seen, I have heard. And David stands broken before him. So if we have sinned, and if we are guilty, and if we feel naked and broken, we too may come to the throne of grace and ask for the mercies of God but dare not plead the, your own merits. Dare not plead your history in Christianity. Ask for the merits of Christ to be upon you. And if this is your desire, and if this is the place where you find yourself, know that today he gives you an audience. And I would like to finish with the words of the Puritan Augustine uh, Marlorat. And in, the Puritan prays the following using Psalm 51. May this be your prayer if you feel what David has felt. He says the following, Father of all mercies, who delights not in the death of a sinner, have compassion upon us and wash us from all our sins that we have committed against thy holy majesty since the time we first came into this world. Create in us a clean heart and strengthen us continually with the power of thy Holy Spirit that we being truly consecrated to thy service may set forth thy praise through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, how good it is to be forgiven. 